Hey everyone, welcome back to the Primal Blueprint Podcast. If you are listening to this, this is also a video episode as well, and you can watch that on YouTube and the link is in the notes. Today, really excited about our guest, former NFL football player, Brett Lockett. He is a serial entrepreneur now, leaving football, businessman, consultant, and performance coach, speaker, and much more. We're going to talk to him about his life after ball today. Welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So let me just, you know, listen, I mean, right off the bat, let's talk about your journey to, be, to joining the NFL because, you know, that really is something that is so many young kids dream, man. You know, I mean, like it gives me goosebumps. I'm, I don't even know you. I'm happy for you. <laughs> uh, so tell us a little bit about that, like what that was like getting to the point where you're like, wow, I'm actually playing for the Patriots. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's crazy because it's one of those things that, as a kid, we all want to, you know, most, most boys at least want to play some type of professional sport. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to be blessed. I think that's, that's, you know, God's gift, if you will, um, which is athleticism for me. And so ever since I was a kid, I was great in sports, whatever kind of sport I was playing, I was great at it. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity to play uh, in, in, in high school and then go to college and I ended up getting a scholarship to UCLA. And so, um, that was kind of that moment right there in, in high school when I first got my first scholarship. My first scholarship was actually Arizona University. So um, I didn't really know how good of a player I was. I was, um, you know, my, my football coach, you know, said, hey, you know, you're, you're good luck at this, at, at this camp that you're about to go to. And I ended up going to this camp and um, it's about 2000 kids in Southern California. It's at San Diego State University. And at this time, this is where all the college coaches can actually go out and, and actually talk to the players. And so we had guys like Pete Carroll, who's now the head coach of, you know, the Seattle Seahawks and who was, you know, the, 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 the big uh, uh, USC head coach at the time. And, um, you know, I just went out there, I did my best and I ended up having a scholarship a week later from Arizona University. And that was like the the aha moment as to, okay, Brett, like you actually can play football. Right. And like, I knew it, right. You, I knew I was good um, playing locally, but when you go on a national level and you're able to compete, that's when, you know, you're like, okay, I, I can really play at the, at the college level. So that was kind of the start of things. And then ended up going to UCLA, um, played there for four years. And, um, you know, after my, uh, my, my final season, um, actually it was my last game of the season. I broke my arm. So I was playing, Pete Carroll's Trojans, they came into the Rose Bowl at, you know, 12 and I think they were 11 and one at the time or 10 and one. And um, they had some of the best players I think that have ever come out of college, you know, Clay Matthews, who was a first round draft pick, um, uh, Brian Cushing, who was another first round draft pick. They were just loaded with, with talent. And so biggest game of my college career, I come up to make a tackle on the running back um, and I literally break my arm. So I hit his shin, his shin collides with my forearm and, and my arm's broken, right? So they take me into the locker room, x-ray, they say I'm out for the game. And, um, you know, I was, I was extremely disappointed, but I knew that I was going to train for the NFL a couple weeks later. And so uh, my agent flew me out to Tennessee, got me out of California. Um, he was like, Brett, we got to focus, you know, th th this is, you know, make it or break it. And so I literally um, went to Tennessee, um, Nashville, Tennessee in a, a sling, and, um, you know, I, I went there with the mentality of I had to focus on what I could control, right? And I think a lot of times in life, when circumstances happen, we start to look outside of ourselves. And that's when the, the, the challenges or the issues really start to happen. And so I, I stayed focused on what I could control, which was how I showed up um, to, to, to work every day and my attitude. And I, I literally couldn't lift. I was lifting with one arm. I was able to run and do all those other things. And so I just focused on that. And so I was out there for two months, came back to California. And um, what, what every college does is they do something called a pro day, which is where all the NFL scouts come to the school and they run them through the same testing that they would run them at the NFL combine. And so that's what I attended. Um, and I ended up running one of the fastest times that day. Um, this was like March of 20, uh, uh, 2009. So I ended up running one of the fastest 40s around a 4.45. Um, I was jacked. I was 211 pounds, ripped. Um, and, um, you know, my agent was like, hey, you have a really great chance of making it, um, of actually getting drafted to the NFL. And so a month later goes the NFL draft. And, um, you know, I knew I wasn't going to get drafted early in the draft. And um, I'm literally waiting on the last day where they're going through the fifth, sixth, and seventh round draft picks and I'm hearing all these guys names get called and it's not me and I'm starting to get frustrated I'm starting to get a little 
a little bit of anxiety and, 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 um, you know, I go out on a walk and, you know, the NFL dra- and then I come back and I watch the last, you know, round of the draft and I don't get called. And so my agent calls me about 10 minutes later and says, Hey, the, the Cleveland Browns want to bring you in for a workout or excuse me, the Green Bay Packers want to bring you in for a workout. And I said, Hey, his name is Barty. I said, B send me wherever I'm, I'm ready to rock. And um, he calls me back five minutes after that and says, the Green Bay Packers drafted a safety, meaning they already paid this guy some money to come to the team. You have a better chance of going and playing uh, for the, the, the Cleveland Browns. So we're going to send you to the Browns instead. And so a week later, I go to rookie camp um, for the Cleveland Browns. And um, it's literally a Thursday. Um, we get there. And the first day, they give us a playbook that's about six inches thick. And they say, hey, we're going to run about 40% of this. So, so get ready. And so I go um, back to my hotel room uh, we're staying, <laughs> where I have a roommate. He goes to sleep at like midnight. I stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning until I didn't know just my position, but I knew everybody's position on the football field. And I knew every single one of the plays that we were going to run. And that, that was just how I was committed. We had a really good coach at UCLA, Dwayne Walker, who played. He was the defensive coordinator for the Redskins. So I had that mentality already that I had to prepare in order to succeed in the game. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, I go back in the next day and, um, and, and not Rex Ryan, Rob Ryan, who's Rex Ryan's brother at the time, asked ask, uh, the defense when we're sitting in the meeting, hey, can anybody come up and, and draw this play on the board? And no one raised their hand. I raised my hand. He doesn't even know my name. He just says, hey, UCLA, come on up. Um, and so I literally go up there and I draw not just my position, but I draw everybody's position on the football field. And so he goes, not bad, right? And so that was kind of my first step into the door. And then so we go out on the field, and I'm the kind of guy that I don't know – half speed. I don't know 75%. It's either I'm going full speed or I'm not doing it. Right. And so I'm on the field I'm flying around. We get into team drills. I'm telling the linebacker, the linebackers what to tell the linemen because they were so lost. They didn't, they weren't studying the plays. They weren't able to, to absorb it as quickly as I was. And so we go three practices over the, the, the next two days. And the final day uh, we wake up to finding out we have a conditioning test as, as if the coach already didn't know who was in shape and who wasn't, but I think this was more of a mental thing. And so um, I had to run 20 uh, 60 yard sprints, 30 seconds in between. Um, and then we got a break after 10 for two minutes and then we ran the next 10. And at this point, you know, this is, this is when everything in your body is hurting, right? You have muscles that you didn't even know existed that are like sore, you're growing, you can't even rotate. It, it's really that I looked at it as a, a, a test of will. And I said to myself that, I'll die on this football field before I let anybody beat me in one of these sprints. And so every single sprint I ran, I would, I would finish, I turn right back around and I get set on the line. And it was, it was pride for me because I knew how hard I worked. I knew I, t- I took pride in outworking my competition day in and day out. And so that was really kind of that, that moment we all kind of hope for. We see in the movies where, you know, Apollo Creed is fighting, right. <laughs> you know, Rocky's fighting yeah. Apollo Creed or whatnot. And so, that was my defining moment and I just took advantage of it. And so after that, usually what happens is coaches uh, will break up, they'll take you to the locker room and then the players who they want to talk to or maybe sign or let go, they'll bring up to the office. Um, And what he did is Eric Mangini, who was the head coach at the time, brought everybody up and he said, Hey guys, um, I, I thank everybody for coming out here and giving it your all. I know this is the biggest moment for everybody here. And I just want to let everybody know we're going to sign Brett Lockett. And my mouth just dropped, right? And I'm like, whoa. And so everybody just kind of started applauding. It was like I said, one of those movie moments. And next thing you know, I'm signed to the Cleveland Browns. And that was how I got into the NFL. That's a great story. What I love about that too, and then we'll get into this as we talk about mindset more is, well, first of all, nothing, nothing's, gonna suck, nothing's gonna substitute for preparation. Nothing. Nothing's gonna, no matter what situation you're in. And also, if I were that coach, I'd be like, why is this the only son of a bee who memorized this playbook last night? Like you all, like not any, like, you know what I mean? Like that, I mean, if you had an employee that didn't, you know what I'm saying? So you showed up, right? You showed up top notch on that. I'm not surprised that that's how it went down. Um, moving forward, in your experience in the NFL, I'd, I'd love to, well, first of all, I'd love to hear like, who are a couple of your, I mean, I'm sure there's so many, but who are a couple of your top favorite football players that you've admired you know throughout your life that you just like oh you know that you love Uh, and then I'll ask you another question 
Yeah, I mean, before I got into the NFL it was Deion Sanders. I think all kids, when you're when you're young, you love the guys who are who are showing out, who are doing the dances. I know right now a lot of kids love Odell Beckham because he's just such a, a chauvinist, right? He he's he's there to to give you a show, and um, that's what I loved growing up. But as I actually played, I really fell in love with um, and it sounds crazy, but Tom Tom Britton. I think everybody can can relate to this, but just being able to play with him um, for three years um, and then actually being able to see what he's consistently done over these last, call it, 10 years um, is incredible. So Tom Brady is, I, I think, kind of the, the model that I kind of model everything after, um, you know, in terms of intensity, in terms of level of focus, in terms of preparation, uh, in terms of teamwork. Uh, I was having a conversation with a doctor the other day and we were talking about how – Kobe and Jordan were the type of guys that made the team better, right? But they all focused on me, right? It was, it was about me. And Tom is the type of guy that makes every single team better, but he focuses on the week. And I think that's a huge, huge difference, particular difference, particularly yeah, in. I'll, I'll accept that, but it's yeah. talking a little smack about Jordan. I'm from Chicago, so no, I'm going to set it aside for a minute. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but I, I totally hear you. There's a difference in uh, attitude and vibration on that. And I mean, I think this is why everyone loves Tom Brady and respects him. You know, it's uh, well, I'm not a Patriots fan because you know the the city I grew up in uh, or the area. I have so so many diehard, uh, you know, Patriot fans here and. Uh, one of them is one of my best friends and she's a woman and uh, she one year said, listen, I know you're not into football and I know, but you have to watch this Tom Brady documentary. Like <laughs> they forced me to sit through like an entire documentary and I'm like, oh, no. but I get it. I really get what a, what an incredible role model he is. And I'm sure an incredible team leader. So I'm not surprised to hear that. Who are some other people aside from players? Okay. So aside from the, the, the game of playing and their athleticism, who are some players that you met either from other teams or whatever over your time in the NFL that you're like, that guy's got a great attitude. You know what I mean? Where you're just like, love that guy. Yeah. There, I mean, there's, there's so many, but, but I think, you know, there's, there's only a few that stick out. And uh, when I say his name, you're going to understand why Ray Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, 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 the game is played with energy that the game life should be lived with a certain level of intensity and, and fearlessness. And Ray Lewis displayed that day in and day out. And he brought the energy to where you may not have felt like you wanted to get up and go out there and play. But once Ray stepped on that field and got everybody going, it was like, I'm ready for whatever, like sign me up. And that's, those are the kind of guys that make teams better. Those are the kind of guys that you want to play with. And, and more importantly, you know, when you're in between the lines, it's, it's very close to being in war. Obviously, you know, you're not, you know, dodging live bullets, but in a sense, those bullets are live, right. And in, in, in the wrong communication or, uh, uh, you know, not, not uh, having the right mindset could, could be an injury for a certain individual or can be a big, big play for, for, you know, being on defense, which is what I play. What about, uh, so, okay, so tell us about, within, like, look, there's obviously just by nature of the beast, there is a lot of ego in professional sports, right? There just is, there's a lot yeah. of hotheads out there, whatever, they think they're great, you know, whatever. Um, it won't be till they're older and they're looking in hindsight and take a look at it. But without naming names or anything, but what are some of the things, some of the beliefs, some of the attitudes or ego stuff that you saw that either hurt players on the field, you know, be, based on their attitude? You know what I'm getting at there? Just, Absolutely. you know, things you were privy to that you're like, uh, no wonder you went down, bro, because you didn't have, you, the, that's the way your mind works and that's the wrong way to look. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's got to be a, some of those. I'd love to hear of a few examples or things that really stuck out, you know, s stood out to you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, it's very similar in any team dynamic, whether you're talking about sports or business or otherwise, you know, you have people that, that play for themselves and you have people that play for teams. You have people that only care about their upside and then you have people who play to make the team better. And, you know, I, I've, I've witnessed it. I've been there myself to where I've been a part of teams where I wanted to have the me, 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 right? Because, you know, you got to think about it. You know, you're, you're going into this locker room and I remember my first year on the Patriots, you have stars like Tom Brady, Wes Welker, Randy Moss, um, <laughs> Junior Seau, uh, guys who are just like legends at, at what it is they do. And so, you know, you're sitting, getting dressed after practice and you got 20 cameras on this guy sitting right next to you. And so there is some ego that does get involved, particularly being a man, because it's, it, it, there, there is this thing of, hey, I want to be the best. Hey, I want that to be me. 
right? And so if we're measuring in terms of, you know, uh, a po political uh, uh, upside, I guess, it, you know, if we're measuring uh, talent based on that, you're like, hey, I want that to be me. And so, um, you know, you, you have to almost get out of your head to where you focus on what you can control, like I kind of went back to um, in the very beginning. And it's it, and understand that it's not about you, your time will come if you do it the right way. And I, I think, you know, I played with a guy named Matt Slater at UCLA. And, um, you know, he was a guy that bounced around, didn't really find a good, you know, couldn't find a position, they put him at wide receiver, because he was fast but he didn't have great hands and they would put him at, you know, defensive back. And he wasn't, he was great. He was good, but he wasn't great there and struggled with some injuries in our last year at UCLA. He ended up returning four kickoff returns um, on, on, um, on kickoff. And he ended up getting drafted by the Patriots in the sixth round. And so Matt Slater is still playing today. He came in a year before me. He's the leader on the Patriots uh, uh, special teams, and he's just a leader on their team. And so you never know who's going to rise up and become that leader. But he was, he's the most humble guy you, you, you'll ever meet um, and, and is just a team player. And those are the kind of guys that you want on your team. Those are the kind of guys that make your team better, as opposed to guys that I played on you know, certain teams with who would, you know, call out certain guys in the media um, that are on the, op the opposing side of the team. And you start seeing these inner, inner uh, team conflicts where guys don't like one another. There's, there's ego involved. There's all the money talk because at that level, you know, it's not just about, you know, playing football. It's like that guy has a two, four, five, twenty $20 million contract, right? Now we're seeing Mahomes, he just signed a half a billion dollar contract, right? And so you step into that and that's a different world. You know, you're, you're coming up. I mean, I was, I was a, a, a free agent, so I wasn't anywhere close to where those guys were. And so you start looking and comparing, you're like, I know I'm better than that guy. How come that guy's making that kind of money? You know, so it, it becomes dif difficult to, 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 I guess, separate sometimes the emotions involved with football or, or just in general, because I think we all do this in life, right? We look at, hey, who's the prettiest? Who's, who's uh, you know, the, the, the wealthiest? I mean, you're in Malibu, I'm in, in downtown LA, but we're both in Los Angeles, right? That there's a big element of, of power here and, and materialism here. Um, and, you know, I know people in urban communities uh, can, can relate to that, right? And so I think it's really just about focusing on yourself and understanding that, you know, you're not competing for, for, for economic upside. You're not competing for, you know, who looks better or, 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 or worse. You're competing for, or, hey, how can I be my best self and how can I outgrow myself from where I was yesterday? You know, uh, that goes to something I talk about in my book, Confident as Fuck, which is that confident people don't compete. Uh, and what I mean by that is because, you know, because you're obviously competing in an athletic competition, but there's a difference between being like, I'm going to go kick their butt, haha, -ha, can't wait till I see that look on their face kind of attitude versus I'm just going to go kill it and be the best. There's two different, that's such a different vibe. One is the looking forward to my ego, whatever, based on someone else's failure or just me being stoked because I hit number one. And that's kind of why I win a lot of stuff because I go into things with that attitude, not, in, you know, not focusing on the other people and what that's going to mean to me yeah. based on that. So that's super true. Uh, I also just want to throw out one more football thing before we get into some of the mindset stuff, because I, I really want to hear about your entrepreneurial transformation. It just came to mind and I'm dating myself here, but you know, when I was a kid, I got to meet Walter Payton and he was so sweet. You know, I know they call them sweetness, right? Do you have a, oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. And that was my basketball number. I chose 34 because Jordan wasn't like in the game when I was playing basketball at that point. Uh, uh -huh. you know? And so I chose that as my, my number. And he was sweet. Damn, he was actually really a sweet soul. Like everyone who met him and knew him. And uh, gosh, you know, uh, just, yeah, just reminiscing about like that kind of vibe back then and, and what he represented, right? That's a guy who's not going to compete to tear someone else down. He's just trying to be the best and do his best. And it really just kind of emanated right through his vibe. You know what? Uh, I, I like to say this uh, quite a bit. And I, you know, I work with a lot of youth athletes nowadays. Um, and I always tell them that good people make good players. Yeah. Right. And if you're a good person, you'll be a great player, but if you, you can't, you this, and, and this was me in, in college, right? I had this disconnect. And I remember my, my junior year where my coach sat me down and he said, Brett, there's no way for you to be great on the football field if you're not doing everything you need to be doing off the football field. And I was the guy who was the partier. I was, 
you know, uh, loving UCLA and, and having, you know, a little college experience, right, within, within means. And, um, you know, he just told me, he said, Brett, if you want to step up, if you want to be the leader, and if you want to end up playing in the NFL, what you do on the field has to match what you do off the field. And my senior year, that's what I focused on. And I didn't have the good year I wanted, but I still got to the NFL, right? And sometimes you don't necessarily know what your efforts are going to, how your efforts are going to pay off. But if you do the right thing, they, you know, nine times out of 10, they'll always, you know, fall into some type of result that you, you know, that you wanted. So what led you out of the NFL? Why aren't yeah. you still in it? And what was that transition like? Let's hear Yeah, that. so um, as you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very um, high injury prone sport. Um, played my first year, tore my growing um, in week 12. Uh, second year came back, first, first two days that we had, this is when the NFL still had two days. So this was 2010. And um, I ended up um, tearing my pec and out for the season. That's a four to six month recovery right there. They had to pretty much reattach it uh, to, to my chest. Um, and so out for the season. And then my third year came back and I'm playing Tampa Bay uh, in preseason, the second game. And I run down and I tear my lower ab and my growing at the same time. And so three years in a row. Damn it. That's awful. Yeah. So <laughs> it, 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 you do not want to have a tear. You, you know when you have a tear when it feels like somebody took a knife and cut you wide I was going to say, I have sprained my groin and that was horrific, horrific. I cannot even imagine. Like when you said that, I cringed. Oh, yeah. I it, it's it no fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no fun whatsoever. So um, that was my third year. And so that was going into 2011. We ended up going to the Super Bowl that year. And, um, you know, we lost to the Giants, but we had a good run. And um, March the following year, 2012, Bill calls me and says, hey, Brett, um, I just want to let you know we're not going to resign you. You know, we, we appreciate all your work and, and, and uh, you know, we wish you the best. And I, I respect the Patriots and I respect Bill because he let me know about that two weeks before I, I, um, I he should have, essentially. And so I had you time. Heads to up where they don't they sometimes come at left field with people, which is not really cool. So that's right. very cool. Yeah. Right. And so um, I went and tried out for the Jets and it was right after pretty much right after my surgery, probably a few months after my surgery. I wasn't in shape, but I, I couldn't you know, waste the opportunity. I went there, didn't have a great workout, ended up going to the Vikings shortly after that, um, had a good turnout, but didn't, they didn't sign me. Then I went to the Raiders for a mini camp and killed it and they didn't sign me. And so, you know, I'm sitting here in July and I'm just working to work out, hoping that I get opportunity. And my agent says, Brett, there's this team in the in the in Vegas called the UFL, the United Football League. Um, there's four teams. They're paying you pretty much a third, well, a, a fifth of what you would make in the NFL. But it's the opportunity you need, and you need film. You haven't played in three years, right? You've been injured three years in a row, and people need to know that you can still play. And so, you know, I, I it was an ego check, right? Um, you know, when you're when you're at this level, the last thing you want to do is go down to this level. And so, I had to, um, you know check my ego in at the door and, and, and go up to Vegas. And uh, we ended up playing four games. Um, I, I had three, four, I had four great games. I kind of injured my ankle, but I had four sh um, great games and the league ended up folding. We were supposed to play eight games. Um, they filed for bankruptcy, but what had happened with throughout that time is it gave me back my identity. And I'm not sure if you've seen the dark Knight where um, where Bane, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you're a Batman, but I'm a big Batman fan, but um, I think you know who Bane is, right? Yep. Right, his arch nemesis. Um, and when Bane dropped um, uh, Batman in the hole, remember we dropped him in that hole and he had to climb out of that hole? That's what that entire year was like for me. And um, it gave me a new identity um, once I came out of that. And so I had to go down to that, that dark, dark place to figure out who I was. And then I signed back with the Jets. I went on a trial um, that the end of the year in December. Um, and they said they were going to sign me at the top of the year on January 1st, I signed with the New York Jets. And so it was pretty much like going into that hole, climbing back out and then signing back with the NFL team. Um, and it's, it, uh, I, I would say it's probably one of the hardest things that you have to do or that I have to do, I would say, because you go from playing in the NFL to making that kind of money to going to a league that nobody knows existed. There's four teams. The players are somewhat okay. There was a bunch of NFL guys, but somewhat okay. It's kind of like it was worse than college, to be honest with you. But I knew that's what I had to do if I wanted to make it and play again in the NFL. So, um, yeah. And then how? And then 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 what happened? You decide to become an entrepreneur. I mean, wh at what point were you? Yeah. So well, to get involved yeah. Let me let me kind of 
Yeah. yeah, let me backtrack. So signed in 2013 um, with the New York Jets. Played all the way till August. Um, after the second preseason game, they let me go. Um, and my body was beat up. I was like, I don't know if I want to do this all over again. I just, you know, just told you about 2012. And so October 6th, uh, the day before my birthday, um, the Green Bay Packers invited me for a workout. So fly out to Green Bay, try out. I had been working out, but kind of not working out at that time. I was living in New York and nothing felt the same. My body still hurt. Um, I still had growing problems um, and I just didn't, I didn't feel it anymore. And so they signed somebody else. They flew me back same day. And that was the day that I said that that's, this is it. I'm hanging it up. And so from there, um, it, it, it became, it honestly was um, probably the, the hardest part of my, my life um, up to date, which is trying to figure out what, what it is that you want to do, what it is that lights you on fire, that makes you as passionate as what you're, pa you know, as football, um, and all while figuring out life, right? Um, and so, you know, I had my apartment in Boston still, I still had um, uh, a place in, in, in Chelsea, New York. And so, um, you know, I was, I, I really was kind of like down and out for about a few months. And, um, you know, I had to, I had to just think about Brett, you know, this isn't you. Um, you know, Brett, you're the same guy that, you know, made it, made it into the NFL the hardest way possible. You're the same guy that, you know, went through hell in 2012 and came back and played, you know, ended up making it back into the NFL. And so, um, I pretty much, uh, used the resources that I had. I had a, a good friend who um, started a private aviation company who I was close to, um, and, uh, ended up meeting with him and he said, Hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm looking to grow this thing. And, you know, I know you have a great Rolodex. I know you, you know, you've done some business while you were playing. I'd love for you to, uh, you know, help me grow this thing. And that company's into jets. And so, um, you know, when I, when we, when we sat down, that was November of 2013. It's now, um, you know, September of 2020, we have 20 aircrafts that we manage. We have, um, a, a book of clients that we fly, uh, globally. Um, it's, it's been a lot of fun and uh, a huge learning experience for myself. And so that was kind of the first, you know, aha moment. I ended up moving back to um, Los Angeles and, um, you know, started getting a lot of opportunities through my network. And I wanted to capitalize on those opportunities. And, um, you know, I said, you know, Brett, you, you don't have a team. Uh, you don't have, you know, a background in finance or business. You need to get that. And I think the one thing with, with high performance that they all realize is they all understand that they have to crawl before they can walk, before they can run. And so I knew that I needed to start with a fundamental understanding of, hey, how can I become the new best at this thing, right? And I think for every person in life, we all go through these ebbs and flows of, um, of transitions. And it, you have to understand what kind of game it is you want to play. And, you know, I knew that football is not that game anymore. And so I said, Brett, what's the new game that you want to play? And for me, that game was business and, and finance. And so um, ended up um, getting an insurance and then um, transitioned into wealth management and realized that that industry is, is, is very, um, they're, they're both very similar, but they both lack accountability. And the the principals hope that you bring them something in return for a small little spread of what it is that you're going to make um and i just got tired of of the lack of, of transparency in the business and so um, i was working with um, some clients i was consulting them and i said hey i i think this is what i want to do um full time because this is the thing that lights me on fire i'm i'm, I'm more uh, beneficial working with them in the business instead of helping them invest their assets and so um, I started uh, at the top of the year, pretty much uh, my own consulting uh, company. And so um, a good friend of mine, Pat Norton, um, at the same time had started something called Newport Ventures Group. And essentially what we did is partnered and I pretty much rolled my business into Newport Ventures Group to where uh, we do high level consulting. Um, sometimes it's capital raising, uh, other times it's working with uh, high level entrepreneurs um, and we pretty much leverage resources uh, to get more deals done. And so it's, it's a pretty much an entrepreneur based platform that allows you to kind of scale um, at will. So tell us, because we do have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to this podcast and, you know, listen, in this world of online, there are just so many new avenues for people to be entrepreneurs <laughs> like never before. Um, 
tell us what are some of the top things that you're like, this is what I see. This is the correction. Like this is some of the problems that either have come up and, you know, when you're consulting entrepreneurs, whether it be resistance, limiting beliefs, you know, we can, we can relate everything to football. We can talk about, you know, right. We could talk about like, okay, mindset, but like, what are some of the things out there that might, you know, someone listening might identify with and go, Ooh, that's me. Maybe I need to turn around and reevaluate. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And there's so, there's so many, and I think you just hit on one, which is, is limiting belief um, in, in the business. And when you look at any business, usually the chokehold on that business is the entrepreneur, right? And when you look at great businesses, there's great leaders involved. And it's the same thing when you look at teams. And so um, a lot of the work that we do is really helping that entrepreneur or that leader in the business really understand his value system and understand how he wants to play in, in the game. Because when your values aren't aligned, you start doing things that don't necessarily align with where it is you want to go. And so you start feeling differently or, or, or looking at yourself negatively because you're not getting things done and you're not prioritizing at the highest level. And so a big part of what we do is helping entrepreneurs identify their value system. So what matters first all the way to what doesn't, because if you tell me, Hey, Brett, um, you know, I, I love my family. They're the most important thing. And it's, you know, it's, it's more important than my business. And, but, but yet you're sacrificing your business, you're, in, you're working on your business for 12 hours a day and you're not seeing your family, that's being misaligned. And that's the reason why your business isn't succeeding the way it should be. And so when we flip it on its head, it's like, hey, how can you focus more time in your business to where we can get more done to where you can spend more time with your family, right? And so instead of spending 12 hours, we figure out systems and processes to actually scale the business figure it out in eight or, or nine hours into where, where you're now spending more time with your family, right? Or maybe, hey, the most important thing is my health, but you're not working out. So how are you, you going to be successful in your business? It becomes very, very difficult. Um, the, the, the next big thing is, is really understanding um, what, what game you want to play. You know, and when you look at entrepreneurship, it's, it's really, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's, it's, it's financial. Yeah, it's financial because it's, it's business and, and the measurement, the, the, the metric is money. But really today, we're not starting, you can't start a business anymore for financial upside. We're, we're past that point in society. You now have to start a business to impact the current environment. There's no, there's no other way right now. I want to highlight that. I just want to yeah. stop and highlight that because I think that's something I haven't heard from anyone. And I, I really like that perspective that also goes to the terrible goal of I'm going to do this for money. Eh, you can end up there and not like it, just like a thousand gajillion lawyers that are out there right now, three years in and they're like, damn it, this sucks. I wish I wasn't doing it, but you know what? The bills are great. Like this pays the money. So it, it is, that's what I tell people all the time. Like, I don't care if you're working a nine to five job that is a, you know, dumb 50,000 a year salary paying whatever. And you, you know, you're paycheck to paycheck. You got to make one step towards the four of something of your passion, something you love. I don't care if you want to start a stamp collection, you want to start a knitting company, it doesn't even matter, but you got to take one step. It, it's the pursuit of what lights you up. Like you said, that usually leads to the yeah. money. So I'm really glad you're throwing out that message. It, it's, it's, it's so important because we get wrapped up into, hey, you know, particularly, you know, I, I call these guys the the nine to five or, or the, um, the, the oh gosh, drawing a blank, hang tight. Uh, the, the side hustle or the, you know, side income junkies, right? The passive income junkies where they're like, I need passive income, I need passive income. And they start doing these small hustles that bring in a, you know, maybe a couple hundred dollars here, or maybe, you know, you may find one that brings in a thousand bucks, you know, guys selling, you know, life insurance on the side or things like that. And I, I, I tend to always, you know, when I, when I do meet someone like that, I, I ask them, I say, like, are you, are you happy with what it is you're doing? Like, are you excited about this? They're like, do you wake out of bed, get out of bed and you're like, I can't wait to sell someone an insurance policy. Like, <laughs> because if, if, if you're not, why are you doing it? Yep. Why are you doing it, right? And we have to get away from, from doing things that aren't going to propel our careers, right? We waste all this time trying to hop on what's hot. Everybody wants to jump into the stock market right now because it's hot, right? Where literally six months ago, people were so afraid of the stock market, right? But now Zoom is up, Tesla's up, right? Apple just did a stock split. Everybody wants to get into the, into the markets, but you got to understand the game that you're playing, right? Because you can't just dabble. 
And there's a lot of people out there who want to dabble in the marketplace and they get gulped up by these huge wells who play at a high level. It's like me going out to an amateur football field and playing football with guys who just dabble. Do you know what happens? I, I wipe them off of the off of the football field, right? Get their ass handed to them, exactly. And, and, I, and I'm not even and I'm not even playing full speed. That's the, that's the scary part about it, right? It, 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 it's because I know how to play the game and I played the game. I played the game at that, the, the highest level. And so, you know, go ahead, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead and finish that. Yeah, no, no. So, so for people who, who are looking, if you're out there and you're looking for, hey, what's the next thing? Find the top five things that you're curious about. And then what you do after that is you find the next five things that you see a problem with in the world. And then you look for intersections as to how you're going to try to solve those problems. And usually what happens is you either uncover something that you didn't know. You may uncover a type of business opportunity, but you know, where high performance plays is you have to, you have to play at this intersection between creativity and, and passion. And so if you can, if you can play right at that, at that caddy corner, you start to really uncover what lights you on fire, what gets you excited. But more importantly, you start doing diligent work that actually creates an impact in your life. What would you say? So look, you're, you know, people are listening to you or watching you and they're going, all right, you know, dude, like you're alpha confident right out of high school, rolling into the NFL track, like nothing but, you know, uh, wh while there might've been speed bumps, nothing but accolades and more confidence just poured right onto you. So what would you say to people who might be lacking some confidence to be able to make that first step or who, you know, or, and, or, Tell us about your own level of confidence and how you see it and where you might've had a hit at some point. I mean, clearly it was a little bit of a blow to finally be like, all right, I got, I'm out of this game. I got 15 ripped muscles. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? like, yeah, man. Um, so I'm sure that was a, that was an adjustment pivot you had to make like that identity. And I get that. I think that's one of the things too. Let's say someone's on a track. Um, it's like this, it's like someone who's a proselytizing vegetarian and then they start eating meat. It's like a real tough thing for them to like come out into the world, you know what I mean? And the kind of same thing goes for someone else who's like, let's say they're like, you know, they've been an actor for this long or they've been this for this long and, and, and they're like, this is what I'm gonna do and they tell everybody and then they wanna change but they're too locked into this, do you know what I'm saying? This like yeah. identity with it. It's, mm -hmm. if you can touch on any of those things. I, I know I threw you a soup of stuff there, but. Yeah, no, I, so the one thing is, is I'll always be a football player. Like that is, that is who, that is how I grew up, right? I will always be that guy that, that wants to compete, the rah-rah guy that, you know, loves being in the locker room and, and working out with, you know, a ton of other beasts, right? Um, that will never go away. But I've also adopted other elements that I've cultivated over the last, call it, you know, seven or eight years, right? Uh, uh, a huge part of it is, is business. Um, a huge part of it is, is high performance. Um, a huge part of it is learning how to communicate articul articulately and speak to, um, to, to, to groups of people to help them and motivate them to, to, to achieve certain things in life, right? And so we, life is about building. Life is about building certain talents and skills to get you to where it is that you want to get to. And so the first thing I always say, if you don't know, you know what it is you're going to do or maybe you're struggling to to get into what it is that you're trying to do now is set some goals. Start by setting some goals. That's the first and foremost thing you should do. And it's not, you know, hey, um, you know, I want to lose 10 pounds. Like, no, like a serious goal. Like, hey, I'm going to lose 25 pounds and I'm going to lose this goal in six, or I'm going I'm to lose this by, you know, January 25th of 2021, right? right. Put, putting a real, putting a good deadline on it. A, a great deadline on it. Their, their goals, goals aren't goals if there's a deadline on it, right? And so, you know, now we have to work backwards and say, how am I going to do that, right? What do I need to do on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis in order to do that? And then what are the small little successes or the small little, um, I like to call them celebrations that I can give myself along the way to make this thing fun? Because if you're doing something and it's not fun, you're not going to be able to get it, get it done, right? Because, you know, why, why doesn't, why doesn't um, inspiration work, right? Inspiration doesn't work because as soon as something becomes difficult, you don't want to go through it because you're not, you're, you're, you're inspired temporarily, right? Intrinsic motivation is the thing that takes from within and the, the big aha, the why they call it, right? But really it's, it, it's kind of passion and purpose intertwined, but the internal motivators that allow you to want to do something, even when adversity hits you in the face, because it doesn't matter what you're going to do at some point, adversity is going to punch you in the mouth and you're either going to have to retreat, right? Or you're going to, Look at your hand, you're gonna look at the blood, and you're gonna say, I'm ready, let's go. Yeah. Right? 
and that's and that's really where where it starts right setting goals understanding what lights you up intrinsically not externally you can't hold a ding, a, a carrot and say hey this is this is what i'm going to do right the shiny corvette or or the big salary that doesn't do anything because as you said attorneys are sitting there billing three thousand dollars a year right and they're unfulfilled because they're not dealing with clients they're sitting in the back right and all they're doing is is, is fulfilling somebody else's dreams Right. And that's and that's why so many attorneys or, or, or people who who've gone into certain uh, careers are just unfulfilled. Yeah. I mean, even in careers where people love and this is like I had this happen to a friend uh, not too long ago. They are an author, have a, a great book that gives them lots of accolades, but they have really been like, I don't want to like, I just don't want to do this anymore. Where most people be like, what? I, you dummy. I, I wish I could have a book. Right. All that kind of stuff. And they were just like. They just had to sit with that and go, but that's just not where my heart is anymore. I don't want to do it, even though that's how they've identified for 20 years, you know, and they got, when I say this too, I, you can use the word God or whatever, but I feel like when you make a pro, you move, no matter what it is, the universe drops a prize into your lap. And I tell you what, when she sort of was just like, I'm okay. Like, I'm going to be okay with that. I'm going to actually do what I want. Not just because I'm attached to a, you know, a, um, career that I've been associated with and like the prize has just flowed in. It was, you know, just her being able to finally admit like this, I want something else, you know? Um, I think it's hard for people to admit that. And I think, I don't know, I, I love the Steve Harvey quote. He said, don't tell your hundred uh, million dollar dreams to hundred dollar people. Mm -hmm. That's my thing. It's like, you know, you've got a big dream and I'm, I don't know if you, this is part of your philosophy when you, when you coach and you're talking with people, but my thing is like, you keep it to the people that are going to encourage you and you try to block and just don't be talking to the nation says about it because your sister Mary, every idea you tell her you have a business, she's always poo-pooing on it. Da, 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 da. Mary's not going to change, man. Mary's <laughs> just going to continue to project confidence issues onto you. They're, people are going to project this onto you. Anyone in an entrepreneurial uh, arena, when you're, and here's why, because you move forward, there's no benchmarks. Like there are benchmarks in the NFL. There are benchmarks with lawyers. You know, da, da, you make partner, you can see where you're going. Same with NFL. You kind of know a lot, entrepreneurship is like kind of zero benchmarks. You have to make your own, like you said, you have to congratulate yourself, small wins and make your own benchmarks. So it's, it's much more unknown. But as I always say, I believe like the unknown is what is filled with the awesome possibilities. It's just really hard for people to start something and have it be unknown as to every step they're going to go to get there. But you just got to take a few, man, right? You just got to, you have to start somewhere. Um, yeah, I, I love everything you just said. And, you know, I, I'm a big believer in working in, in silence and in, 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 in quietness, right? I don't, I don't tell a lot of people what I'm doing. Um, you just, you just kind of see it pop up, you know, a press release or, you know, uh, an ad or something like, Oh, Brett's doing this. Now I, I know when COVID hit, you know, I, I was, I wasn't doing any type of videos or speaking or anything like that. And I just hit the, the, the button and it was just marketing up the, up the, you know, the Yang. And so um, I, I believe that, you can't talk to people who aren't on your team about what it is that you're doing. Because when you do, and it doesn't matter if they're, they're, they're your spouse, your, your friends, your, your family, if they're not with you in the trenches, it's very difficult to talk to them about what it is that you're, that you're doing because nine times out of 10, they've never done it. And they're always going to give you their best advice on what they think is best for you. And got and, and there's, I've done this at times, right. And I had to get away from, listening to other people tell me about what they thought I should do and start sticking with, Hey, Brett, what do you really want? And I always ask myself on a daily basis, like, Brett, what do you want? Brett, what's most important? Brett, what's the number one priority? Every single day you have to do that because you start getting lost in, 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 in the, in the emails that the text messages, the phone calls, right? Because every time you're getting an alert, every time you're getting um, some type of notification, it's somebody that wants something from you. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, I love the working in silence. I when I came out with my, my first book, The Paleo Thyroid Solution, everyone kind of knew it was rolling out. It was a pre-sale. And then I did the second book, Confident as Fuck. And I just literally no one knew it. Like I just dropped that thing and people were like, I had no idea. And I'm like, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, exactly. I there, love was, that. there was no time to have anyone be bullshit feedback from people. I didn't need, you know, just just show up and rolled it out. You know what I mean? And yeah. um, you know, I think that's that's really interesting too. The other thing, and on that same note, someone had asked me about that they're like oh well here you were you're this health author and then you're going over and now you're talking about you know mindset and confidence and they're like how did you get people to see you that I'm like you just do it like I didn't wait for permission for someone to be right I didn't wait for permission for someone to go 
Yeah. Okay. All right. I see you as this. I mean, most of the time I probably would have gotten objections. People would have said things like, well, you're like a health author though, initially. So, and I'm like, yeah, and I'm also, I've also been in TV and film as a comedian. Like I do a bunch of things. Yep. So what do you say to those people that are, you know, having trouble with like, again, like that, that concept of like, I want to switch gears, but no one's going to see me over here. Like, I'm sure it was tough for you. People be like, yeah, right. Entrepreneur, whatever. You're just a dumb football player. Like, go oh, enjoy your retirement. I'm right. sure that there was some vibe there too. Yeah. I, there's, there's always a challenge when you transition into something new. Uh, the, the, the big thing is always the, the mindset. And usually how I've cultivated my mindset is I've, worked endlessly to become an expert in what it is that I'm doing, right? And when you become an expert, it pretty much, um, you, you start to get away from the people who don't necessarily uh, believe in what it is that you're doing or, or may not necessarily, you know, hey, this guy isn't, isn't an expert at what he does, so why would I, why would I work with him, right? Um, and so you, you, you can't, look at what it is that you're, you're trying to do and say, Hey, like, you know, I'm concerned about what other people are going to think. Right. Because once you build a brand, you can do whatever you want to do. And that's, I think that's the big thing that you've done in why you've succeeded and why you're going to continuously succeed is you actually have a brand, right? And today it's, it's really about digital real estate, right? Once you, once you have that real estate online, you can now pivot and do whatever you want to do. Right. And, and, and follow your passions, right? Your first it's health, right? Because, you know, that was your story. You know, now it's, you know, I'm confident as fuck because this is my new story, right? And this is what I have to get out to the world. And, you know, I, I, I listened to a quote earlier today and they said, there's no way for you to create something that's perfect in the world if you don't actually put it out, right? So essentially saying, put out something that's imperfect in order to create something that's perfect. Totally right. Like that's the, that's the, also the, the, the trip up of a lot of entrepreneurs is like, I'm going to spend a hundred years taking a hundred courses, making everything perfect before I finally launch that. And you're like, you know what? That's just not how it rolls out. You got to <laughs> just do it. Right. Like yeah. there's going to be a typo in any book, no matter how many editors you have, I'm telling you, um, you know, it just is going to happen. Uh, you know, in sort of closing up here, tell us like how, how do you work with people? Is it one on? I know it's one on one and with company, or is it one on one? Or how can we benefit from you? We'll put everything in the show notes. But tell us how you work with entrepreneurs and and what that's like. Yeah, so um, I, I work with uh, individual entrepreneurs, um, and I work with with companies as well. So um, working with teams, um, I'm actually working with a good friend of mine right now um, on a, an experiential type of uh, event for corporations, particularly helping teams build, um, helping teams understand how to deal with adversity, particularly right now. Um, and so um, there's really three types of ways. So I speak to groups. Um, I, I do team building exercises um, that help groups kind of form a cohesiveness to be able to go out and achieve whatever it is they're doing. And then I work with entrepreneurs from a performance base as well as in their business as well. That's amazing. And we'll put everything in the notes, but tell us where people can go online and find what's your website. Yeah, sure. So my website's broadlocket.com and um, I'm pretty active on Instagram, uh, Twitter as well. Um, and Facebook, not so much, but not so much, but you can find me there as well. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. And are there any last uh, words of wisdom you'd like to leave with our audience on entrepreneurship? Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate, you know, the, the you putting this together and everything that you're doing. I, I love your brand and, and what it is that you're doing, but I think the, the big message that if I could leave it with anybody, doesn't matter what you do, it would be if you master your mind, you can master anything in life. Um, doesn't matter what it is that you're doing, but we're all in pursuit of really the same thing, which is finding happiness within ourselves. But if you can understand what lights you up, if you can understand um, what, traumas you're dealing with and understand, hey, this is how I have to get over these things. You start to master those, you start mastering your mind. And so it starts there and everything in your, in your life will start to fall in place. And then quick follow up, who are some of your favorite um, mindset teachers, coaches, authors, people that you know have inspired you over, over the years? Gosh, there's, there's such a big list. Um, Tony, Tony Robbins, of course, um, he's, he's, he's part of the reason, he's the one who really started this. Um, uh, Stephen Kotler, who's, who's a good friend of mine, um, you know, one of the, the top researchers in, in flow and, and peak performance, um, his, his COO, who's become a good friend, Rian Doris, 
um, uh, Dr. Um, Scott Barry Kaufman, who is uh, a genius psychologist. Um, gosh, there, there's there's so many people. My my business partner Pat Norton. Um, there's there's so many guys, but um, you know it, it's 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 about finding the right guy for you. Not everybody's going to fit for you or gal. Um, and, and finding the person that you feel can take you to where you want to be. Absolutely. Really well said. Thank you so much for joining us and to everyone else. We will see you next week. Thank you.